Hello everyone, it's CM Kozeman. I know we had a poll and I know the poll came in favor of arachnids and not beaked whales but I was simply too taken with this subject to pass it up. Hello everyone, I hope you're doing alright. This is CM Kozeman and today in this amazing mega podcast we are gonna review every single species of beaked whale. That's an animal. That's actually one of the most spectacular and beautiful group of animals that are out there. And what's so fascinating about them is that there are more people who have seen UFOs than there are people who have seen some of these entire whale species. More people have seen Elvis or Slenderman or the Mothman than some of these whale species that we are about to see in this podcast so before beginning please consider three things one donate to me on patreon you know all of these videos don't make themselves so any penny you can spare is really welcome number two try to play at 1.5 or two times the youtube place setting or whatever that is makes me sound like a cooler person and number three subscribe and please leave a comment with these being said let's go so you know almost everyone knows whales and dolphins they're cute vivid diverse they're almost synonymous with a healthy ecology or nature but did you know that there's a group of whales that's so obscure it reminds me of okay so if you were a kid in the 90s and you were playing these made in japan 16-bit mega drive games inevitably you get to a certain level where it doesn't matter if the game is about dolphins or ghosts or space or ghostbusters or a cowboy or whatever if this game was a 16-bit game platformer made in japan inevitably at one of the later levels you would run into something like <laughs> anyway these beaked whales are exactly the same thing except it's done in cetacean cladistics and not 16 bit games what could it be mystery animals since the dawn of time people have noticed that some whales are not like the others this is a 15th century Icelandic whale guide so you, you see all these big whales you see the filter feeding whales something like an orca probably you even get the walrus which is represented as something like Rotzungur aha uh -huh. but what's this Dink. I mean for a long time people knew that there were these certain kinds of whales that are not like any of the other groups they're quite distinct they're extremely rarely seen and they're unique and there's just something haunting about them yes ladies and gentlemen these are the beaked whales the group otherwise known as the family Ziphidae that's Z-I-P-H-I-I-D-A-E and they're also phylogenetically quite distinct from other whales as well so if this is your family tree of whale classification you got this one branch which leads to all the filter feeding whales then you got everything from dolphins to killer whales to sperm whales in this one other branch okay and here they are aside from the sperm whales which are also another weird group a distinct group all of their own and you you see all the dolphins and killer whales and even the river whales or whatever 
they all fall off to another branch of the toothed whale or the dolphin family tree. I mean, you got the vanilla whales and you got the dolphins, except these guys, they are like, there's something bizarrely obscene about the way they look. They look like a dolphin enlarged to a maximum size. Of course, I cheated a little in this picture. This picture is to scale, but I made a trick. The baleen whale, which we normally imagine as huge, this is actually one of the smaller species, and this is actually one of the largest known species of beaked whale. We're gonna see them all, but just to make them more distinct, I use this size trick on you. But anyways, these are quite bizarre things on a, on a group, all of their own. And people have been fascinated and perplexed by them since they have been hunting and killing whales, I guess. So here we go. Let's study a few of the basal forms first. These are all going to be fossils, so there's not much distinct characteristics to any single one of them. But you have to like look at them as a whole and examine the shapes of these skulls as they kind of evolve from more generic toothed whale-like forms towards a more distinct asymmetric skull that these things have. So you got something called Caviziphius, Eoborosiphius. These are like too basal and too fragmentary to classify. Then there's something called Benesiphius. Just to make um, explain these things, this is the top view of the skull. You see the skull is kind of asymmetric, and this is the lower jaw. So then you got Shavinsiphius, which is kind of evolving this weird long snout. Then you got this thing called Cohen Conesifius, which has this kind of big, big processes on the sides of its skull, but they're kind of asymmetric. So these these whales do something with their skulls. It helps them hear and detect sound in a certain way. You see, if you view the skull from the side, it almost looks like a ceratopsian, almost, these processes. But of course, in real life, this thing had a big, smooth head, Kind of like a long-faced, bizarre whale dolphin thing. Then there's this one form called Daganodum, which sounds like an Australian slang name, but it actually is a proper scientific name. So it kind of looked like this extremely long beaked dolphin with teeth. Aha, that's another thing, by the way. These guys still had all of their teeth. Now, present-day beaked whales, with certain exceptions, almost never have all of their teeth visible. There are only two teeth at the tip of the snout or elsewhere. We will see. But this is a more ancestral form, Dagonodum. Maybe these guys were ancestors of some of the river dolphins, but I don't know. Then there's this one, Globicetus, kind of like a proper fat chunky form. Not so different from those that are alive today. Then there's this thing called Mesapithecus. No, no. Mesapicetus from the Mesapian Basin, I believe. But again, this is like a very long snouted dolphin whale kind of thing. And you can see the skull is quite huge. One meter long, almost. So the rest of the body must be even larger. So we're looking at a really distinct kind of whale. Look probably like this. <coughs> Anyways, but you see, the two bottom teeth, there's something special going there with the, in, in, in evolutionary terms. Anyways, then there's this thing called Ninosiphius, which is kind of similar, probably died really, really deep and fed on deep water fish. And then there's this thing, a more thick snouted form called Notosiphius. Then there's this thing called Tuskisiphius. You're kind of skimming these over because there's just too many of them. Probably look like this, Tusky Ziphius. So not too different from the beaked whales alive today. But you still you can see this like extreme elongation of the body, reduction of the forelimbs, enlargement of the head and the snout and the little teeth 
at the end of the snout that define this group. In fact, this is how they live and feed today. So what they do is they dive to extreme depths, these whales. They live in places that are so far away from the land that some species are not even seen alive. Imagine that. And the way they feed is they dive to these extreme depths and then just go, just give it a suck. And they suck their prey in. And apparently this is really effective. So there are many species of these things. And they've been going around for a long, long time. Another form, Ziphyrostrum. I mean, Google all these forms and there are quite interesting things in the papers that describe them. So now we come to the present day living groups. So this is the Berardinae subfamily that contains a few very distinct forms. The first of them is Berardius beardi, Baird's big twail. And it's one of the more familiar ones. It's quite huge actually. And it's got these tusks sometimes there's these cheek swellings in males, but it's just a... I mean, imagine seeing something like this. Nine out of ten people would think it's a sea monster. Anyways. And usually now, thanks to drone technology, we can see more of these animals. And they're quite big, quite distinct. They're hunting groups, but they almost never let themselves be approached. So elusive creatures. And of course... There are some of the few species in this group that are hunted commercially. Japan takes about 10 of them every year. And so here we got the news story. Fisherman landed the first Baird's beaked whale of the season on Wednesday, local authorities say, said. The whale, a 10 meter long female weighing roughly 10 tons, is a huge, huge animal. Just look at it. Almost has no eyes, like they fished this strange alien from the depths of the sea and this is a sad picture i mean i don't support whaling but ningen have to eat too i guess and truth be told 10 a quarter of 10 whales per year that's still really cruel but is it any cruel than eating meat now, there's this whole philosophical debate here that we shouldn't get into right now. Then there is a mystery form of this one. For decades, this article says, Japanese fishermen have told stories about the existence of a dark, rare beaked whale that they called Karasu, the raven. That's funny because the words Karasu in Turkish they mean black water, in Japanese they mean raven, but that's one of the fascinating few mutually intelligible words that the two languages have in common. So that's an interesting side note. Anyways, so this one certain population of this beaked whale might be a distinct form, but who knows? Unknown! <laughs> Anyways, then there's another species, Berardius arnuxi, Arnox's beaked whale. It's quite similar to the previous species except it lives in the southern hemisphere and here you can see one jumping near antarctica plish that's all you get to see if you're lucky you could venture your whole life on the world's oceans and still never get to see one anyways mm. these also have their own distinct forms and who knows maybe they are distinct species but we'll see we'll see and then there's a tiny form that has just recently been classified berardius minimus which is like the previous other two species it probably is the black form of the arnux beaked whale mentioned earlier but it's smaller and we know this particular species from a very few strandings mostly in New Zealand or Japan. So once again, they're a mystery. They're a genuine USO, unknown swimming organism. And then there's an extinct species recently discovered as a fossil. 
named Microberardius africanus. And we know this guy from recent fossils, so not much more is known about them. Then we go, go on to the big, big group, the hyperodontid family. That's a kind of like a subfamily in this group that has many, many species. And boy, starting with Africanacetus, there are also some extinct forms in this subgroup as well. Let's go skimming. There's this one called Ihlangesi, which has got a really long snout. There's this thing called Koikoisetus, which has got like a long and also broad snout. So if you saw this thing alive, it would probably be like one big, huge, long, smooth, snouted, blind whale kind of thing. And then there's another similar species called Nenga, which is a beautiful name, I must say. And then there's this another, uh, there is this other species called Pteroketus. So there, there's also Zosacetus, probably from South Africa. And then we come to the living forms. The familiar Hyperudon ampulatus, the bottlenose whale. It's called a whale, but obviously it's something distinct. This is what it looks like. Just drink it in, people. I mean, check out the weird toothless jaws, the huge forehead, the absolute gigantic size of the thing, and the weird, almost human-like eye. How strange. And unfortunately... This guy is also known from a lot of strandings. That's almost all we get to see them, really. I mean, but just look at them. The, f the one in the foreground is a male. Look at its prolapsed penis. Unfortunately, sometimes accidents cause these guys to strand. I mean, there's many theories. Some people say it's because of submarine sonar experiments, but no one really knows. But this is what they look like when they're happy and alive. And also, since they get stranded, sometimes their relics, their skulls, you know, there's this interesting piece of news I came across when I was doing my research. Police hunt after skull of rare whale stolen from Cockloburn Beach. Oh my God, what a lawless place. Cockloburn Beach. And of course, scientists are appealing for it to be returned because it's against the law to own any part of a whale carcass without having a license in that part of the world. These laws obviously are in place for ecological reasons, I guess. But, you know, sometimes they just feel like overregulation, plain and simple. What license do you need to ap apply for in order to like scavenge the beach for a stranded whale skull like what's the paperwork like who processes it who gets paid to process that interesting anyways then there's another species that's really similar once again it's a southern hemisphere kind of thing hyperudon planiforms the southern bottlenose whale and look at its skeleton oh I imagine trying to reconstruct this in never in a million years would I come up with this result I mean it would never look like this if I reconstructed it if anyone reconstructed it it would look like one of those 16 bit unknown game monsters but anyways this whale is also particularly cute for being the subject of many um, stamps in the British Antarctic Territory, Falkland Islands, which is also a part of Great Britain, South Georgia and Sandwich Islands. Britain has a whole range of stamps devoted to these whales. And then there's a smaller form called Indopacetus pacificus, which is like a lesser known, smaller Pacific kind of form. I mean, no one really knows what these guys are up to. I mean, they're known from... 12 strandings, a little over 65 sightings. And the cool thing about this guy was the original specimen specimen that led to its that led to its discovery, you know? I mean, you're discovering an entirely new whale genus. Where do you think they found it? 
Out in the open sea? No. Stranded on a distant beach? No. The original species was actually found in a fertilizer factory in, I believe, either Somalia or Ethiopia. It was taken there because people found this dead whale. And, you know, it's not good for anything. So let's take it down to the fertilizer factory. And just someone noticed it there. This gigantic, unrecognizable sea monster. And it was described from the murk trash heap of a fertilizer factory floor. How bizarre and how cool, dare I say. All right. Recently, more of these elusive whales have been photographed and they look like this from a distance. I mean, they there's more than 25 species of these guys and from a distance, they almost all look alike. You can never tell. It's like a UFO sighting. Then we got, got the big, big genus, the big daddy genus, Mesoplodon, which contains many unique species. Let's go. Here's Mesoplodon bidens. Doesn't mean... It has got this really awkward uh, personal displays of affection ag around women. No. Biden's alludes to its tooth or the number of its teeth. Bi means two. Dens means teeth. So the two-toothed mesoplodon beaked whale. And it's also been photographed with the rare ability to fly. Nah, I'm just joking. But, you know, you, you see these things. They're gigantic, enormous whale, dolphin monsters. You think they're really sluggish. But no, actually, in real life, phew, they're quite active. And actually, one of these whales are illustrated in the famous Torburn's Guide to Mammals, which is a really, really cool guidebook dedicated to British mammals. And there, you know, it's got this... 1920s illustration with a very distinct black and white contours i really like this image i had that book as a kid you know looking at it i always saw this beaked whale and it always looked like the weirdest of sea monsters so 30 years later i am doing a youtube video about it which is good then you got mesopodon bodoini it has never been seen alive. We only know it from carcasses and skeletons. And just, just look at it. I mean, the body is very thick and stout. It's got these neural spikes. You know, wouldn't you rec reconstruct it with a sail, perhaps? And its teeth. It's got two teeth, but they're really large. They're like those of a boar. And don't even get me started about this part of the skull, which has this enormous ear or hearing or melon organs i mean scientists think that they use this jaw arrangement and the weird skull to kind of hear sounds really really accurately so that you know they can track down their swimming prey they don't echolocate as much they just listen and home in and suck their prey in. Amazing animals. And here's what it looks like in real in the flesh. From a more recent stranding. Actually, in the last 10 years, we have enjoyed a renaissance of beaked whale strandings and sightings. Thanks to the proliferation of smartphones. Now everybody can take and share a photo. But coming back to this thing, look at this weird drawline. It's just beautiful and this one although the scientific name is Bodoini in common terms it's known as Andrews beaked whale and it was named in honor of this guy Roy Chapman Andrews who famously among many other things discovered the protoceratops dinosaurs in the Gobi Desert just a overall interesting guy i mean to make the family history more interesting he also had a son who was kind of brutalized under his father's overbearing personality 
So his son became a kind of Mediterranean adventurer, archaeologist, and he lived a secluded life on a Greek island and just wrote books and stuff. Interesting family. Just Google them. Actually, when you're researching your favorite animals, always Google the anim- uh, Always Google, always search, research the people that discovered them, the people who discovered them, or the people who they are named after. You will never be disappointed. You will always run into these interesting personalities. Then we got the also little known Carl Hobbes's beak tail, Mesoplodon Carl Hobbesy characterized with its two big teeth and its white cap-like spotting on its forehead. Here you see more photos, but once again, no one really kind of knows where these guys live. It was named, scientifically described, in 1963. Imagine, color TV has been around for longer, and its skull just Just look how beautiful it is, like as a visual artifact. Amazing animal. Drink that in while I drink some coffee. I'm just recovering from a bad, bad cold. Maybe it's Omicron, but I don't give a fuck at this point. But stay safe, stay healthy, get vaccinated. Anyways... Mesoplodon Carl Hobbesy was named after this really nice, cool based scientist, Carl Levitt Hobbes, who was one of the leading ichthyologists of the American century. Really cool guy. Unlike many other scientists who at those times came from pri- privileged backgrounds, Carl Hobbes was from a working class or let's say non academic family. And so as a result, he had a more Uh, friendly, a more based and a more accessible understanding of science and he is just very well loved. Go go read about these guys lives and memoirs, you won't be disappointed. Anyways then you got Mesoplodon densirostris, Blainville's beaked whale. Sometimes its teeth look really gnarly, like this or even like I mean, look at this. What would you do if it came out of the sea next to you while you were skinny dipping? I don't know. Just a cool, cool animal. And it's even become the subject of really cool stamps from the French territory of Nouvelle Caledonie, New Caledonia. This beautiful island full of amazing Araucaria trees. Just amazing place. And in its waters, an amazing animal. Then you got the recently described Mesoplodon eueu, which has the one of the strangest scientific names. I mean, it was described around 2021. So scientifically, it was named last year. Can you believe it? An animal the size of a cow or even larger just completely completely on unnoticed it's known from a little few little places just check out this map at first glance it looks like a the map of a single island but look closer it's actually the map of the world projected with uh, orientation on the oceans this really is our world ladies and gentlemen it's a planet of oceans and the land masses are like an afterthought and in it still lurk many many secrets isn't that beautiful heck imagine if this flat earth thing was true okay and imagine if we had like an ocean 20 million miles across surrounding our continents and imagine the beaked whales that would evolve in that setting. Mm-hmm. There's a speculative evolution project just for you, animals of the infinite flat earth. Anyways, this is what Mesoplodon Eweu looks like. And then 
You got Mesoplodon europaeus, which is an Atlantic dwelling species. It's not too big. Then you got Mesoplodon ginkgo dense, which is one of the coolest of this bunch. The ginkgo toothed beaked whale. Its teeth resemble the profile of a ginkgo leaf. So really swollen at the base and really tiny at the tip. Just really beautiful, aesthetic animal. And here's a photograph, a bad photograph of a stranded specimen. And here's what the skull looks like. You can see the teeth. Whoosh, whoosh. Elegant. Then you got a related species, which is Mesoplodon hotaula, also known as Derania gallas beaked whale, known from Sri Lanka and surrounding regions. Previously, they used to classify this as Mesoplodon ginkgo dance, but they, look, they took a closer look, and the teeth are kind of different, the genetics are different, so they named it a new species. Let me look at my notes. And it's named, I mean, its common name is after this amazing, amazing individual, a true Renaissance man from Sri Lanka, Paulus Edward Pieris Deraniagala, just a genius. His family, so his brother was single-handedly almost responsible for starting modern arts and modern painting in Sri Lanka. And Edward Pieris Dera Deraniagala was also like a polymath. He was a sculptor, a painter, and a paleontologist. Almost like, I mean, now, in this day and age, Year of Our Lord 2022, I am, among many others, interested in arts, interested in fossil animals, interested a little in mysticism, mythology. And, you know, thanks to the internet, I can unite all these interests and I'm also an artist of some repute. And I know many people like myself all around the world. Heck, I mean, people in, in Sri Lanka, Australia, the UK, United States, even in Turkey, Spain, Brazil. It's like a global phenomenon. But this guy was one of the first. He studied in Harvard and Oxford University. And he just was, he was like one of us, born one or two centuries ahead of his time. And he's got really amazing books. Just look him up. And, you know, if you find this book, the P.E.P. Dera Niagala commemoration volume, just buy it online. Don't care how much it costs. I've seen prices like $80, whatever. Pay it. Heck, if I could buy it from Turkey, I already would have bought it. So don't miss, don't miss your chance. If you donate to me on Patreon, maybe click. I can buy this book one day. I don't know. But the way things are going with the world's economy, I think I would sooner buy Next week's grocery, I don't know. Things are bad, man. But we're still chuckling. Anyways, Paulus Edward Pieris Deraniagala. Amazing person. Who lent his colloquial name to an amazing marine mammal. In fact, this... What, was it this one? No, sorry. Ha. Huh. Okay, until recently, in guidebooks, there used to be something called Unidentified Big Whale. This account is based on very sketchy data. On or on supposition from characteristics common to better known mesoplodon species. Unfortunately, until stranded or dead specimens are available. So this was like something that would appear in guidebooks. You know, there was at least one species of unidentified beak whale running about marked by this really striking color scheme so recently they almost identified it positively might be this thing or maybe it's another species mesoplodon traversi no one 
has seen this species alive. It's the rarest of all other things I mentioned to you so far. Probably looks like this when alive, but it's known from this spade-like teeth in the sides of its jaws. A bit like the ginkgo toothed one, but slightly different. Then you have Mesopodon grey, grey's beak twail, another middle-sized species, kind of looks like this, probably, when alive. Isn't it amazing? Like, all of these animals have a photo and a painting. But if you search for their names online, you see five or six different paintings for the same species, and they look like five or six different species. So the paintings are really inexact, but also really cool to look at. Look at this thing, I mean. Imagine seeing one alive. Heck, imagine being one. What would it think? Just ultimate introvert. Or maybe not, because some live in family groups. Then you got Mesoplodon hectori, Hector's big tail, another small species. Here, refreshingly photographed alive and not as a putrefying corpse. Then you got, oh, you got one of the best species of the bunch, Mesoplodon layardi. If someone designed something like this for a speculative evolution project, you know, I would say, uh, maybe needs more work, man, but, you know, thanks for the effort. Because it has teeth so long, they're like straps. They encircle its snout, and the animal cannot open its mouth properly. Unbelievable. Looks like this. When you... Look at it head on. Oh my god, PowerPoint massacred my pictures here. But anyways, the the teeth completely enclose the top part of the snout so it can't open its mouth. What happens instead is that it just opens it a little and <coughs> sucks in its prey. And you know, these are huge animals, so I guess it doesn't impact their lifestyle. Just suck it in. Unbelievable. It's known as the strap-toothed beaked whale. Then you got Mesoplodon mirus, which also lives in the North Atlantic. Skeleton looks like this. Just bizarre. Once again, a head like a guitar, body like a spider, and with tiny hands. And don't even get me started on this thing. What the hell is this? It's not even a digit. It's just a bone like protruding from imagine the imagine when you rotate your hand you got two arm bones but one has got this bone finger poking through that's how they solve the flipper support problem so the flipper begins like this and it's just a big round blob of flesh then you got mesoplodon perini described in 2002 from california I mean, look at its distribution map. It's like a map of UFO sightings. 1997. But recently, it has been photographed. And it's this chubby, yellowish colored guy. Just jumping about. Then you got Mesoplodon peruvianus. It was described in 1991. Known from a few, spe few sightings. Cool animal. And also a few strandings. It's distinct from the others through its slate gray color I guess and some details of its skull but interesting how you see how the fins slot completely against the sides it just becomes this big diving torpedo shaped teardrop kind of thing amazing creature and then you got Stejnegar's big whale, Mesopodon State Negeri. It's known, it was described from a single skull on an Oregon beach. So, very recent and very little known. But you see, even the artist impression has this little slot the fins can fold against. It's like a diving missile almost. And the skull looks like this with this blade like beautiful teeth quite distinct from the other forms 
And then you got the final group of the beaked whales, the Ziphinae subgroup. And once again, we got a few extinct species, Isicosiphius, Nazca cetus, named after the Nazca lines and distinct for having a lower jaw longer than the top jaw. So would make for an interesting paleo reconstruction. And then you got a living form, Tasmacetus shepherdi, shepherd's whale. So this guy is distinct for having multiple teeth in his jaws. So in that way, it could be considered more ancestral. And this is one of its few known photographs. Just look at it, like a UFO photograph. A, B, C, labels, blurry image. I mean, isn't it amazing? We got clearer photographs in brackets of the Bigfoot. And that's just the weird modern day pop folklore that we call cryptozoology. But when you look at real zoology, real study of real animals, you get far more wonderful things. You got these strap-toothed whales that cannot open their mouths, whales that lock their fins to their sides like torpedoes, you know, whales that have never been seen alive. Amazing. And then you got the more common and widely known species. This is actually one of the most better known, let's say, beaked whale species. Ziphius cavirostris, Cuvier's beaked whale, named after the famous French, was, was he French, Cuvier? Fr famous father of paleontology. He looks like this. Not the man, the, the animal. Just a bizarre, pink, purple, orange-headed, mascara-wearing, scar tissue-covered, swimming torpedo of a beast. Just beautiful. And this is what they look like when they have given up the ghost. But this guy is one of the deepest diving of all marine mammals. Imagine they surface, take a breath, and they dive. This is from a recent study. They put these tags on these whales. And, you know, this species is more accessible, let's say. It's not as elusive as the others. So they could tag them. And this is the data from the tags. Let's look. Let's study. The median duration for a dive is more than 35, hmm, 32, 33 minutes. Some dives are even longer than my podcasts. I can't believe it. Here's one MF, ZC Tag 41, who was underwater for almost two hours on a single breath. And the depth is also fascinating. The median depth is 800 meters. That's huge. And you got some outli outliers that dive almost to 3,000, 3 kilometers underwater. Can you believe it? If you drop a stone, it would take more than an hour to get to that depth. And don't even get me started about the pressures. It would, you know, if I'm, I might be mistaken, but war submarines cannot dive deeper than two kilometers because the pressure of the water would crush their hulls. These guys, they just lock their fins, dive. Amazing. <laughs> and the world record is a staggering 3,000 meter dive that lasted 222 minutes. Can you believe it? 2999. Heck, maybe the sensor broke and it actually dived to 3060 meters or something. Unbelievable. What's it do there? What's it feed on? Well, I'll show you what it feeds on. This particular species, Ziphius cavirostris, has been observed to have these gigantic rat tail fish in its stomach. Albatrosia pectoralis. An interesting name too. Just like a 
real day modern horror so they dive to the deepest parts of the abyss and feed on these nightmare fish and they're just squishy and soft and good looking cool creatures and who knows who knows the depths of the sea are almost certainly home to more species of beaked whales i'm talking about at least 10 more would be my bet in fact in 2009 a group of scientists including my friend darren nash of the tetrapod zoology fame run this algorithm study for species of seals and they plotted the rates of discovery for new seal species and they concluded that you know four or five more species might be lurking out there and that's just for the seals i believe the curve would even be let's say less steep for beaked whales i mean just last year one was described and you know it's almost certain that more are out there awaiting discovery so that's it everyone i hope you like this podcast if you want to learn more about beaked whales or whales in general just i recommend these three books to you the first is beaked whales by richard ellis great book full of illustrations a little dry but you know what can you write about this group you don't know much the best thing you know about them is that most things about these whales are unknown or you could get to these two really good field guides and they really put them into perspective they display them alongside all other whales dolphins or other sea mammals and you get this really nice comprehensive view of cetacean diversity as always this has been a fun podcast to make i hope you had a good time and please comment below with your questions what else do you think might be lurking out there and before we say goodbye please 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 i mean i got the flu for christ's sakes and you know even if you donate one dollar per month on patreon you know what that one dollar gets me flu medicine for the next month that i'm sick little things little things like that they really add up and i am thankful to you all for watching viewing commenting subscribing and supporting me if you support me on patreon you can also get this powerpoint presentation for free plus a lot of other good goodies you want to know sneak previews from my other books all tomorrows you gotta subscribe they're all up there in patreon anyways thanks and as always have a good time this has been a cm cozaman podcast <laughs>